Greetings. This box of tricks is an old alarm system by Sixth Sense International. Once again, I can find no trace of it online. I'm pretty sure it's nothing to do with a weight loss center in India. On the front, it's got a siren, some status LEDs, a control knob, and a key switch, which I don't have the key for. It's got options of off, test mode, and fully on. Around the back, we've got a DC input jack, which I've determined needs at least 16 volts, a two amp fuse, and a seven pin in socket. More on that in a bit. Popping the lid off, we see that it's got a little 12 volt backup battery, which if that's a date code on the top, is 25 years old and is long gone. If I connect it to my CTEC charger, it doesn't even see if there's a battery connected. These wires over here are tied up for testing as I don't have the key. So what I've done is I've fitted a switch down the bottom so we can have a play. On the board there are a handful of chips, just a quad op amp, two triple five timers, and a pick running it all. Something of interest in here though, which I think is key to the whole thing, is a microphone tucked away in the middle of the board. Let's put it into test mode and see what it's for. Now my first thought regarding this was it's some sort of acoustic alarm that would detect an intruder clattering about. But as you can see, it's not bothered in the slightest about me talking in front of it. So it's not that. Second thought, glass break detection. Could it be designed to pick up high frequencies made by breaking glass? Well, I've got an old double glazing unit here. Nope, it's not that. I better go get a dustpan and brush and clean that up. It's not a high frequency detector, it's a pressure change detector. So it doesn't care about high frequencies, but a puff of air is enough to set it off. I've drawn up what's hopefully the correct schematic. Let's take a look at it and see if we can figure out how it all works. As with previous teardowns, a high res version of this is linked to in the video description, so those playing along at home can peruse at their leisure. In this zoomed out state, you can see a number of areas. Top left is the power supply, Top right is the siren circuit with some op-amp stuff below that. Bottom right is another op-amp circuit on a daughter board. Bottom center is the front panel. And in the middle of it all is PIC 16 c 54 running the show. Let's start with the power supply. We've got a DC jack feeding a 5 volt rectifier that's got its ground pin lifted by a pair of Zener diodes and a rectifier diode. With an input voltage of at least 16 volts and up to 25 volts, otherwise it exceeds the rating of C21, this puts out 14.3 volts. This supply has no battery backup, but only goes to two locations. That's the green LED on the front panel and this diode, which is basically the charging circuit. The battery can take as much of what is now a 13.9 volt supply as it wants through its own two and a half amp fuse. This now battery backed supply now splits two ways. One way is via a two amp fuse, which feeds the seven pin DIN socket, a back EMF protection diode and pick pin RB7, which is presumably just checking that the fuse hasn't blown. The other way is through the key switch. This can either arm the alarm by switching on the 13.9 volt on rail, or put it into test mode by switching on the 13.9 volt test rail, which in turn feeds the on rail as well via a diode. The test rail feeds into one of the op amps and is also sensed by pick pin RA0. The on rail feeds the buzzer and the siren circuit. It also feeds a second 5 volt regulator, which provides the 5 volt power to the pick, the op amps and the daughter board. So that's power. What next? Let's take a look at another easy one, the siren. This is a pair of triple five timer chips, but could easily have been done with a single double five six, or with a bit of tweaking, the board could have been designed to take either option, depending on what's available. The left hand one puts out a slow square wave, which hits R4 and C3 to form an RC waveform, which depending on the component values, will look like something between a triangle wave and a shark fin. That feeds the control pin of the right hand timer, which is output in a much higher audio frequency, but which then gets altered by the input waveform, making it sweep up and down. This whole circuit has its ground connection switched on and off by Q4, which is switched by Q2, which is fed by pick pin RB2. As long as the alarm is in either the on or the test mode, I can trigger this by grounding pin one of either of the timers. I've disconnected the sounder for now to make it well a bit more bearable to test. I'll reconnect that right at the end of the video so you can actually hear what it sounds like. 
I've also got both of my oscilloscopes hooked up to pins 5 and 3 of U1, so you can see the two different siren waveforms in action. The scopes are running completely different sweep rates, so you can see both the waveforms properly. On the Hammeg, you can see the triangle or shark fin. On the Rigol, you can see the siren output, which is going up and down, up and down in frequency. And you can see the position of the shark fin corresponding to it. So as that's going up and down, up and down, that's sending the frequency up and down, up and down. That's most of the easy stuff out of the way. Now let's dive into the weird bits. The microphone feed comes straight into the daughter board marked U4. There's no component numbering on this board, so I've had to basically make all the numbering up, prefix with a U so they don't clash with anything on the main board. The microphone gets its power from a bias resistor and the resulting signal is also available at the edge of the daughter board, it's just not used. I've assumed that this gives the choice between connecting a microphone which needs power on the same pin as its audio signal, or one which doesn't. From here the signal goes into a quarter of an LM324D surface mount op amp, configured with what looks like a low pass filter on its input. The output of this comes out of the board, but again isn't used, but then goes through a DC blocking cap, that output is used. But this is where the circuit all gets very strange. That output goes to a variable resistor feeding another op amp, U6A, back on the main board. The other side of the resistor has the output of the op amp go via a capacitor and through the selector switch on the front panel. This has 10 settings numbered 0 to 9 and selects anything from an open circuit to a 0 ohm link. The return signal from this comes back onto the daughter board via a combined 9.09k resistance to the input of UU4D the output of which feeds a resistor into U4C. The other input of these op amps is just a voltage set by a 180k and 470k resistor pair, and the output from the daughter board from this resistor pair also goes to the other input of U6A. It's all screaming out to me that I've missed a connection somewhere, but I can't find one, so I've just marked this down as a 1.4 volt output. Plying on regardless, the outputs from UU4D and UU4C are taken to the edge of the daughter board but not used there, but UU4C can drag down the inverting input of UU4B by pulling down on diode UD1. Pulling that down is going to raise the output of UU4B. That output goes to the edge but isn't used. However, it will cause this transistor to turn on and ground its collector, and that goes to pick pin RA1. The UD1 pulldown also has an effect on another op amp circuit on the main board, this time pulling down the non-inverting input of U6D, which is capable of in turn pulling up an input to U6C, which is another op amp capable of dragging down via CR12 an input to UU4B, this time the non-inverting input, so you can force the op amp off and turn off the output transistor, blocking it from alerting the pick but it can't do much to block it if pin 10 is being dragged high, either by U6D or by the test mode supply. It's all really weird to me, so I think the best way to find out what's going on here is to just scope it all out. Here we've got the unit in test mode with the unbiased microphone input and the amplified output both being monitored by the Hammeg. As you can see, it's just picking up my voice at the moment, but it's I can talk a bit louder or make a bit of noise, but you can see the, out, the output is there's very little response from the output. I've also got the signal generator from the Rigol coupled in via a T-piece into here, so I can actually inject a false microphone signal from here. It's got a 650 millivolt offset because the unbiased feed from the microphone is actually biased, it's just not biased to the full microphone supply voltage. It's got a 0.65 volt bias to it. So this has a 0.65 volt bias. It's set for 100 millivolt output. At the moment it's 50 hertz. And if I turn this on, it'll replace the microphone signal with my own. And you can see at 50 hertz, there's a little bit of response from the, the low pass filter, but very little. Let's dial it down. We're down to 30 hertz, 25, you can see it's starting to pull a bit now. But still no response from the alarm. 
now you can see we're coming down to 10 hertz there's much more pull from this let me adjust the, the waveform capture There we go. I can dial this down further. We'll go down to nine. We come into, into just that's an eight hertz signal. You can see now that the low pass filter is really starting to let things through now but it's still not enough to upset the the detector down to 6 hertz now it's starting to really climb in fact they'll have to adjust the scale on that Ah, oh, there we go. That's just started triggering then at 4 hertz. Let me get this thing sweeping again. There we go. So yeah, 4 hertz seems to be the threshold. At least for that volume, I can obviously I can I can increase the amplitude on this as well. There we go. If I turn down this signal, the if I take that down a notch, it's going to probably want a higher voltage. before it'll trigger. Let's take it down a bit more. You can see now it's going to need a much louder signal or presumably a much lower frequency. There we go. You can see it's triggering again. I've just turned. Up, I've got the the amplitude way up there. So let's take that back down. Right, we've got that down to 100 millivolts and 3.68 hertz. Let's keep on dialing down. Right, let's see what effect that has further on in the circuit. I can check the end pin of the front panel, which is the common point of the switch, and you can see it's got this 200, nearly 250 kHz sine wave, which is affected if the microphone gets puffed. I can also check the return signal from that switch, which is also available on two of the pins on P1. Obviously in the maximum position it's a dead short so it, there's going to be no difference there. Let me dial it down. And in fact I can take it all the way down. I can probe the output from UU4D. And UU4C. I can test the inverting input to UU4B and the input to U6D. I can check the input to U6C and the inverting input to U6D. The output from U6C. 
and the output from UU4B which feeds the transistor that triggers the alarm. Now remember the test mode has a bearing on U6C and U6D, so let's arm it properly and see the difference. The input to U6C and the inverting input to U6D The output from U6C and the output from UU4B which feeds the transistor. Right, I think that's everything that can be tested pretty much over on the microphone input side. Not that I'm any the wiser really, a lot of it is still really confusing to me. But uh, let's head back over to the front panel. Most of this is straightforward enough. You've got three LEDs which are controlled directly by the pick. One of those LED feeds also runs a transistor though. This is just to make sure that the green half of LED2, which is normally fed by the 14.3 volt power input, is turned off if the red half is turned on. Without this, it would be either green or amber rather than green or red. Now we come to the pick in the middle. I've dumped the code from this and it turns out I also dumped it five years ago so I'm not sure where this actually came from now as the person I thought I had it from I wouldn't have seen five years ago. Anyway, this has got six outputs, three of which are LEDs and six inputs, three of which are to do with the seven pin DIN socket. To see what these do, I have brought them out to a bit of strip board with some LEDs and switches. Pick pin RA1 is pulsed to ground by the daughter board to trigger an alarm, so it goes without saying that pulling it down at the DIN plug does exactly the same. It only does it with a short pulse though. If the signal is grounded for a few seconds, it's ignored. The pick doesn't respond to any change on RA2. But that may be my fault for not testing this breakout board before plugging it in. Thanks to some stray solder about halfway along on the board, there was a 1k resistance or thereabouts pulling the RA2 input up to about 13 volts. The resistors on the main board will have reduced this somewhat, but I still reckon it's had a zap of something way over the supply voltage and knack of the input. RA3, it definitely responds to though. Remember that LED is connected in place of the sounder. It doesn't matter whether this is in test mode or fully armed. Pulling RA3 down to ground instantly sets the siren off and turns on the alarm output. And 10 seconds later, it then turns on a second output as well. So that's test mode. I went using it properly. I've still got the siren disabled, but let's see. First of all, you get an exit tone. Thirty-five seconds later, it's armed. Interestingly, at this point, and also in test mode, it doesn't care about the fuse on the back. All it'll do, if that fuse is removed, is turn the status light amber. It doesn't set the alarm off, it doesn't care, it's just warning you. And it can go amber because this is the status light which has the two inputs off the pick. It wouldn't be able to turn this one amber. Triggering it, sets the entry timer off. Flicking the switch off at this point, we obviously turn off the alarm. Leave it though. And the siren triggers, along with the alarm output. And again, 10 seconds later, the secondary output. Five minutes later, It just drops the outputs and rearms itself. The only difference is now that it's got a red light indicating that it has been triggered. Now I'd have thought this second output would have stayed active uh, to run a strobe because the alarm output, you don't want the sounder going forever because you'll just get complaints. But the, there's no limit as far as I'm aware with regards strobes. You can just leave the strobe running for days. So I'm surprised that turned off. So that's what it's for and pretty much how it works. There's one last thing to check out though. 
What's P2 for? Let's jump it and find out. Test mode. No difference in that regard. That's RA1. RA2. Still knackered. RA3. Still instantly kicks the sounder off. Let's try arming it. With it armed, is it still concerned about the fuse? Not a bit. That's the same duration. Yeah. It just gives it a much shorter alarm time. So there you have it. An odd little alarm system from the 90s. One last thing though. You haven't heard it yet. I've reconnected the siren. I will drop the volume at this point so you're not going to pop your eardrums. I'll be needing these though. Here we go. Hope you liked it. Thanks for watching.